Uh, Senator Pratt, we have Mr Voigtman here. If you'd like to, and we're ready to go public when you are. Yes, thank you. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Education and Employment References Committee into the operations of General Motors Holden in Australia. This is a public hearing and a transcript of the proceedings is being made. It's also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, you're protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. We generally prefer to, for evidence to be given in public, but under Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in a private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken. The committee will determine whether we insist on an answer having a regard to the ground which is claimed. The committee determines um, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera, such a request may of course also be made at any other time. Uh, please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. I'd now like to welcome a representative from the Australian Automotive Dealer Association. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, will you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? James Vortman, CEO of the Australian Automotive Dealer Association. Thank you. I'd now like to invite you please to make a short opening statement at the conclusion of your remarks. I will invite members of the committee to ask questions. Thank you. You may now commence with your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. The Australian Automotive Dealer Association represents all of Australia's franchise new car dealers, including all of the Holden dealers. When GM announced it was retiring the Holden brand, it terminated some 185 dealers in the process, and many of these dealers had represented Holden for generations, some for over 80 years, and played a major role in the success of the brand. In return for the right to sell their cars, dealers were required to make significant investments in state-of-the-art facilities, modern servicing equipment and tools, in staff, software, and the list goes on. These investments, which often run into the millions of dollars over the course of an agreement, were made in response to commitments from GM. Commitments that they would be here for the long haul. Commitments that they would be bringing in new models to support this um, vision. Commitments enshrined through dealer agreements, all of which were subsequently breached when it announced it was leaving Australia in February. Months before the announcement, GM was signing off on the sale of dealerships. It was allowing dealers to continue with very expensive capital expenditure programs which they had demanded. GM's actions in allowing this level of investment by dealers was incredibly reckless and there is no doubt it has harmed many businesses and their employees. It is clear that all Holden dealers are entitled to fair and reasonable compensation, but unfortunately GM, a company which earns revenues of $200 billion a year, has embarked on a process which has denied dealers fair compensation. They've simply refused to negotiate and pushed back against entering mediation, only agreeing when the ACCC applied pressure. They thumbed their noses at Minister Michaelia Cash's call for them to extend their compensation offer and participate in arbitration, and they've pressured their dealers by dangling future servicing work in front of them and explicitly threatening the prospect of a lengthy and costly court battle. GM seems to be a law unto themselves and the epitome of a large, powerful offshore multinational using its position of power to exploit, to exploit the smaller businesses it deals with. They've set an incredibly dangerous precedent, and in the process, they have emboldened other vehicle manufacturers to exploit the imbalance in power that exists between them and their dealers. As we speak, I'm hearing of a number of Honda dealers that have been terminated, and I'm told the Japanese car company is engaging in aggressive tactics in its compensation process. Mercedes-Benz has already said it will be changing its distribution model in 2022 and will not be compensating its dealers. Recently, one of their global executives told the media that, that, we, that they would be moving to this model in Australia because the law allowed it, whereas in other markets such as the US, the law does not allow it. 
-hmm. We've seen other manufacturers start inserting clauses into their dealer agreements, which state that a dealer can be terminated for any reason. And in the event of that termination, they will not be compensated. For some time, the industry has been calling for stronger regulatory protections to govern the relations between dealers and offshore manufacturers. And the Holden example is further proof that the existing franchising code remains impotent and grossly inadequate in protecting dealer interests. You need look no further than the US for examples where dealers are afforded appropriate protections. And I cannot overemphasize the level of urgency with which such regulations need to be put in place. And in particular, we need a better system to, revolve dis to resolve disputes with a system of binding arbitration when mediation fails. Mm. This should be the central recommendation of this inquiry. Many people will say that this is all in the past, but while Holden cars will no longer be sold in Australia, 1.6 million registered cars remain on our roads. Only yesterday I received information from on ASIC website, which was brought to my attention, showing that GM Holden, as recently as the 29th of October, 2019 changed its corporate structure from a limited company to a proprietary limited company. We really do need to understand why this was done and how it affects the liability of General Motors Holden going forward. This is important for the Holden dealers who have not yet settled with Holden are considering legal action. However, it, is wider, it has wider importance because GM has ongoing obligations to the owners of its vehicles and to the dealers servicing these vehicles. They need to honour their Australian consumer law obligations. They need to honour their recall and warranty obligations. They need to guarantee the supply of parts. They should demonstrate what funds they have set aside to honour these commitments, particularly under the obligations its parent company has under US federal law and certain statutory obligations. GM does not have a good track record in this area, which is why it is currently subject to a court enforceable undertaking with the ACCC although this was signed by the previous limited company. As a sign of good faith, GM should extend this undertaking beyond its expiry at the end of this year. In closing, Holden is part of Australian folklore and the iconic brand belongs to all of us. Even the actions of GM cannot change it. However, we do need to learn from this painful lesson and take the necessary actions to stop this from ever happening again. This inquiry needs to examine the way in which dealers were misled it needs to look at GM's behaviour since that announcement and the way it has compelled dealers to accept inadequate compensation. It needs to look at the wider power imbalance that exists between dealers and manufacturers and make recommendations to remedy this balance. And finally, it should also ensure that GM fulfils its warranty and part supply obligations to the many Australian consumers with Holden vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll now give the call to uh, Senator O'Neill, and then I think uh, Senator McGrath and uh, Senator Faruqi. We should all have a. You should all have about ten minutes each. I think leaving with a couple of minutes with for Senator Barrell also at the end. Um, th thank you very much, Chair. And I wonder if Mr. Bortman might give us a copy of his opening statement. Absolutely. I've sent one through to the, the Secretary. Oh, great. Thank you. Good. I have a hard copy. Thank you very much. Um, could you just, you've, you've raised some amazing points in your evidence today, Mr. Vortman. Um, you know, most Australians who brought a Holden car and are driving their family around it or their youth that they're taking to work this morning would be absolutely stunned to think that General Motors are acting in this heavy handed way with Australian businesses. Mm. Um, you know, small to medium sized businesses in some cases, but quite large businesses in other cases mm -hmm. right across this country. So uh, it, it's, it's quite shocking to hear the evidence that you've just given. Mm -hmm. Could you please outline the timeline of events and key moments from General Motors' announcement to depart the Australian market to the 30th of June that cause you to question the goodwill towards Holden dealers? Well, absolutely. Look, you know, I suppose our submission touched on the central question of when did General Motors actually know that they were going to be winding up their Australian operations? And that is a very important question because, um, you know, within recent months, um, dealers have been investing significant sums of money in capital expenditure programs that GM asked them to do. Um, there are also instances where dealerships have been uh, changed hands in a sale process, and all of those 
were approved by General Motors because it's a condition of every franchise agreement that they do approve those sales. So it's when really did General Motors let those people who spent, in some cases, millions of dollars, as, a, as you know, as recently perhaps as November last year, mm. when did the dealers who sell the cars to ordinary Australians, when did they actually find out that General Motors was going to walk out? The announcement from memory was made on the 17th of February, and I believe they heard, uh, in most cases, shortly before the media reported it. So on the same day? Yes, I think there would have been uh, some private conversations held with members of the dealer council, but um, every sort of dealer I spoke to or have spoken to heard on the, on the same day that I heard, which was the 17th of February. The 17th of February, so I'm advised that it was actually about 15 minutes before General Motors made the announcement. Mm. They let 185 small businesses across Australia know that they were pulling the pin and walking out of the That's country. That's right. Uh, some of they, they did it, I understand, via a conference call. Not all dealers were available, so some of them would have heard it later because they might have been uh, travelling on business. Some of those dealers wouldn't have been in a position to tell their staff before those staff would have heard it in the media. My goodness. So, um, in your submission, you discussed General Motors' Rayong plant in Thailand that mm. manufactured Holder's leading sales vehicle. Yeah. Could you please outline your concerns with that sale process? And if you could also give me an indication of you know, how many cars come into Australia and you know, is it possible that General Motors only let the Thailand producer know 15 minutes before they made the announcement? Is that possible? No, I, I don't believe that is um, uh, sort of possible. I, I would assume, and we don't know any of this, but I would assume that the sale of an automotive uh, assembly plant is a, a complex process. Um, you would think that there would have been discussion, first of all, at the GM board some time ago um, about the prospect of selling this plant. You would think that would be followed by a discrete, discrete process whereby potential buyers were informed about the, the fact that the factory was for sale. The buyer, in this case, which was, general, which was Great Wall Motors, would likely engage in a lengthy consideration of the strategic merits of acquiring the factory, and that would be followed by an even more lengthy process uh, of due diligence. Um, there would then be a thorough negotiation, you would think, with, between both sides, uh, whereby they would eventually arrive at a price, involve the lawyers, we've got another few months. I am certain that this would have been an incredibly lengthy process, potentially lasting as long, you know, years rather than weeks or months. So I believe this decision was in the pipeline for some time um, because common sense dictates that it would have been. Um, and my view is that the minute that factory, uh, that they decided that that factory was to be sold, that is when the whole future of Holden in Australia is called into question. And at that point, I believe GM had the moral obligation to many of its long-term partners to inform them to cease capital expenditure programs, to refrain from engaging in a buy-sell process, and to basically uh, sort of protect them financially. Um, thank you very much, Mr Vortman. Um, were the Holder dealers asked to invest in local showrooms? whilst you believe there, wa there was a sale uh, process being undertaken of the, that manufacturing plant of Holden's best-selling car. Sorry, sorry, Senator, I don't think I, I quite got the gist of that question. So, just, just to be clear, mm -hmm. do you believe that Holden dealers were actually asked to invest, in some cases millions of dollars, in showrooms, while behind the scenes and without revealing it to the dealers here in Australia, Holden were actually shutting down the supply and manufacturing of uh, Holden's best-selling car in that Thailand uh, manufacturing site? I believe the prospect of that factory being sold and by extension the prospect of Holden withdrawing from Australia was strongly being considered uh, by General Motors um, in, you know, I would say within the last number of years. I have no way of proving that, but, you know, common sense dictates to me um, that it would have been a, a process that started some time ago. Um, how long have I got, Chair? Four minutes? Thank you. I'm reading your lips there. Um, could, could you please uh, describe the practice of approving the transfer of dealerships to new owners and the example you give in your submission? Yeah. 
So, um, you know, when you sign a dealer agreement with, uh, with uh, uh, many manufacturers, there, there are often clauses that state if you are of a mind to, to sell that dealership, you need to uh, get approval from the franchisor, in this case, uh, General Motors Holden. Um, and we've received reports um, of a number of dealerships that, that changed hands um, in, in the six months before the announcement. Uh, there was one that happened, uh, you know, literally the month before, in January, um, the transfer of a dealership uh, from one dealer to another. Now, um, when you do buy a dealership, uh, you, you sort of, you know, that only has sort of two and a half years left on that franchise agreement, you're buying for the future. You're buying a lot of the goodwill that's been invested into the business over a number of the years. And if you'd known that <laughs> within a month General Motors would be uh, sort of withdrawing Holden from Australia, there's no way known that you would even consider um, purchasing that business. I've got a number of technical questions and I think I have to put them on notice given the time, but did the Prime Minister provide any assurance to look after 9,000 employees and 185 small businesses such as the Holden car dealers across Australia in your conversations with him? The Prime Minister expressed uh, great concern uh, around the behaviour General Motors was exhibiting at the time and, and uh, the meeting I had with him and a number of Holden dealers was, was only uh, a few days after they made their announcement. So he, he did express a strong concern over the plight of, of Holden dealers and their employees. I'm, I'm pleased that he was concerned, but in your meeting on the 26th of February this year with the Prime Minister, you were also um, accompanied at that meeting by the Minister, Minister Andrews. Did the AADA propose any policy solutions, to help, policy solutions to help the Australian car industry, such as a separate dealership code? Did you ask for mediation? Uh, and what was the reception and response from the government? Because it's, I, I know that they're concerned, because I hear that they're concerned yep. all the time. The problem is I'm looking for any action. Yep. The AADA has been on the public record for a number of years, um, stating that we need a separate automotive uh, set of protections uh, to remedy this problem, which is the power imbalance between dealers and manufacturers. Uh, you know, we've, we've been raising it and we've been raising the element within those regulations of better mediation process for a number of years. Um, and indeed, the committee, the Corporations of Financial Services absolutely. Committee, made recommendations and I've met you in that context That's before. Right. Um, what was Minister Andrews' response when you advocated for a car dealership code in respect to car manufacturers? Minister Andrews on 1 June um, has, uh, through a responsibility, uh, developed a schedule to the Franchising Code which gives uh, certain protections to dealers, but we've again been very clear that we don't think it goes far enough. We, need the, we, we believe those protections have to be expanded significantly and we believe that they have to include the element of, of stronger dispute resolution mechanisms. So when the government wrote to General Motors um, calling for arbitration, two days, like they waited, like you, you've been in negotiations for, with him and communication with him for a long time. You had a formal meeting with mm. the Prime Minister and Minister Andrews on the 26th of February. Mm. Despite all that, they waited until two days before the 28th of June, to, that's the, the, the deadline was the 30th of June. Did the AADA be believe that calling for negotiation two days before the deadline would help solve the dispute between General Motors and the Holden car dealers? Senator O'Neill, that was your last question. Thank you. Senator, we, we have experienced how brazen automotive manufacturers can be. Um, when Minister Cash called for uh, the, negoti the, the compensation deadline to be extended and for GM to participate in arbitration, I actually thought that that would give General Motors uh, sort of, it'll give them the opportunity to take stock um, and uh, consider that request. Uh, at least extend the deadline and come back to the minister. But um, I was even shocked by how quickly they came back and dismissed the minister's uh, suggestions as I believe inappropriate and unhelpful. Um, the timing of the request, you know, we, we make no view, we, we have no view on that. We are appreciative that the government did make that request, and I think we all should be uh, disappointed at how brazen General Motors were 
in, uh, in basically dismissing it. The, the government has had its power legislation to make this stuff happen. Um, you've been asking them to put in regulation for a very, very long time. You know, I, I'm a little more cynical. It sounds like it was a PR exercise. We look like we're doing something. We'll call for arbitration. You've been asking for that mm. for years. They didn't bother. The last minute they wanted to show that they were doing something. Well, all they did was put out a press release. There was no actual, there hasn't been any arbitration, has there? There hasn't, but once again, you know, when a Minister of the Crown um, asks a company to uh, sort of uh, go down a certain path, you'd expect that they gave it, give it serious consideration. Um, we're appreciative of Minister Cash's efforts in that respect. and. Um, you know, incredibly, incredibly disappointed at yet another exercise of, uh, you know, sort of ill ethics by General Motors. I'm afraid it feels like flowers Senator after the breakup from Senator, Senator Cash to the industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Um, I do want to go to the, the, the conduct of General Motors, and you use an interesting word there, um, ethics in relation to, to how they've behaved throughout this whole process and before uh, the, the decision was made public. Now in your submission, you do say on um, page seven of your submission in relation to dealers who, who believe that General Motors didn't act in good faith, has misled them and, and treated them in an unconscionable manner. Can you add some can you expand upon that in terms of, of how General Motors has behaved in the treatment of the 185 Holden dealers across Australia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I, I think you have to put General Motors and Holden into context in Australia. I don't think there are many brands as iconic um, in Australia as Holden is. And, um, and they're iconic to, to the consumers, but they also had uh, you know, hundreds of local businesses that, that sort of took on dealerships and, and uh, helped them uh, grow that brand over a, a long period of time. So you would think that those businesses were worthy of a, a higher standard of treatment. But we've touched on the way the news was broken uh, to, to, to the dealers, and you know, I think that left a poor taste. Um, you know, we had examples where Holden executives were basically, you know, going back a year or so before the announcement, um, were sort of uh, making very strong commitments through the media, in private, that they were here for the long haul. These questions were being asked by dealers. Um, they, they were being asked on a regular basis and they were assured at every step of the way. So that's why they feel misled. Um, we then move into the process of compensation and, you know, on the day I spoke to a number of dealers and they were telling me that General Motors had assured them they were going to engage in the best practice compensation deal um, which would set the benchmark. A week later, um, the compensation offer landed and every dealer I had spoken to claimed it was grossly inadequate. We then had a situation where they refused to negotiate or budget all and uh, were probably emboldened by a pandemic um, because a lot of the attention was taken off them. Um, they refused constantly to engage in a collective mediation process and only uh, sort of came to the table after the ACCC shamed them. Uh, you know, and uh, then we, we had the, the situation discussed around the, the government asking for them to enter into arbitration. and. I'm probably not surprised at, um, at them not agreeing to, um, but you know, once again, the brazenness with which they did that uh, did not sit well uh, with, with uh, you know, many people in this country. Uh, so, so th look, that's, that's probably, is that what you wanted, Senator? Yeah, it's interesting that you raise uh, coronavirus. Mm. Um, you know, it's been put that that the General Motors um, have not behaved as a good corporate citizen. Is, is that something you, you would agree with in terms of their, their conduct through Absolutely. The... And I think you'll see in our submission, we believe that's been the case for uh, around a decade now. Mm. Um, a, a company that's received um, significant 
taxpayer funds. And uh, you know there are a number of steps um, since 2009 that they've undertaken, which has called into question um, how good a corporate citizen they are. Mm. It's been put by um, some dealers that I've spoken to that the General Motors have have used um, coronavirus almost as an alibi to to disguise or camouflage. Their, their poor corporate behaviour. Is that something you, you'd care to comment on? Yeah, so um, the coronavirus uh, is obviously, it's the biggest news story in you know, 50 years. So um, it's inevitable that GM have benefited from some of that scrutiny being removed of them because uh, you know there's just simply not as much focus. So that, that's just been a natural benefit. But I understand they've also used it um, as part of their sort of compensation offer to suggest that because of the economic hardship that they're experiencing, that they need to stagger the payments, for instance, um, the compensation payments that will be uh, given out. Uh, so the pandemic certainly has taken this in a direction that, that we, you know, we wouldn't have liked. We, we would have appreciated a lot more focus and scrutiny on General Motors and their actions, um, but, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, that's the situation we find ourselves in. And, and the uh, practical effect is that a lot of those dealers um, will be suffering extreme cash flow pressures, and um, that will factor into many of their decisions to sign compensation agreements, because we're just not in an environment where you can afford to take on a, a, a global uh, giant like GM in the courts, because that'll cost you a lot of money, and it'll go for a long time. One of the, the issues, and uh, Chair, I think this will be my, my last line of questioning is, is when the decision w w was, was made to retire the brand. And we've talked about the, the 15 minutes notice that was given to Holden dealers, and anyone who's been involved in business would know that when you're making such a decision, you don't just wake up one morning and after you've had some Vitabrits decide I'm going to to retire the Holden brand from Australia. It, it's something that that would have been in would have been planned for for weeks and months, if not years. Mm. Possibly well not possibly, you know, connected to the retirement of, of right hand drive vehicles. Um, when do you think mm. which year or month? Can you give us a year or month? When do you think General Motors made the decision. Was it when they made the decision in relation to the plant in Thailand? You know, um, hmm. are you able to comment on that? Um, look, I, I can only hazard a guess. Uh, I, I believe they they signed new dealer agreements with all their dealers. I believe uh, in 2018, and uh, I would suggest within a year, a year and a half of that, they would have started looking at their sales figures. Um, and would have started questioning the economics of, of uh, you know, sort of uh, continuing to sell Holdens in Australia. Um, and dealers, you know, as disappointing as that was, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that the Holden brand's being retired uh, is not as dis We understand, you know, sometimes economics happens and you just simply can't afford to continue uh, with a a business um, and dealers understand that but there is a way that you treat your business partners on the way out and you need to engage in a, a transparent process which is finalised with fair compensation and the dealers in Australia have not even come close to realising that. So, so your top line would be that Holden dealers didn't want a special deal they just wanted a fair deal? Absolutely, okay. 100%. Okay thank you. Back to uh, you Chair. Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Portman. Thanks so much for coming in to provide evidence today. Um, I just wanted to get a feeling from you and your understanding of what government could have done better to prevent this situation, given that, as you mentioned as well, there has been so much public funding and government assistance given to GM and the automotive industry over the years. How could have government prevented this? And 
how do we make sure that things like this don't happen again in the future? Uh, I think the only way we could have prevented this specific uh, situation is by having a system of binding arbitration in the event that mediation fails. Uh, the, the GM withdrawal of Holden from Australia, the biggest failing in all of that was that the dealers could not access justice. Um, you know, and it, it sort of demonstrated the frailties of the franchising code and it, it, it uh, sort of it showed how important it is that we um, take the action that is needed and entrench a system of justice uh, for dealers because there is a major power imbalance and we see that there is a system of arbitration for other industries where there's a major power imbalance, whether it's the dairy industry, whether it's the food and grocery industry. And, and currently there is a, a code being developed by the ACCC on media bargaining and that has a proposal for binding arbitration. Um, I would suggest we have one of the biggest power imbalances of any industry, you know. Every car manufacturer is basically a Fortune 500 company. Um, and yes, some dealerships, dealer groups are, are powerful, but they pale in significance in comparison to these car manufacturers. So um, when faced with an army of lawyers who can drag out uh, a court uh, process and make it very expensive, I think we need to implement a system which has a number of steps, the final one being uh, binding arbitration um, for, for settling disputes between dealers and car manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries in their submission, I think it's submission number five, they've suggested that dealerships are, and I quote from their submission, in the main far from small businesses and are not in a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis the manufacturers. How would you respond to that? It is a ridiculous assertion. Um, it's one that's been rolled out for a number of years. Um, it was used during the, um, the PJC uh, inquiry into franchising, um, and uh, the facts completely dismiss that assertion. Um, as I said, uh, there are significantly large dealer groups in Australia, but they are nowhere near as financially powerful or resourced as global car companies. Uh, it's, you know, this is, this is a question of a balance of power. It's, and you have to look at dealerships in the context of the size of their franchisors. And in our industry, there is no bigger uh, franchisor um, than car manufacturers. So we completely reject that assertion. I'm also very concerned about the 9,000 people who work employees in those 185 dealerships. Um, and I understand that some um, dealers have taken the compensation, have agreed to the compensation package. Um, could you kind of um, tell us a little bit about how those workers are going to fare? Like, what are your concerns for those employees now? Well, when this broke in February, I had strong concerns because, um, you know, particularly regional dealerships, there just aren't many jobs in those country mm -hmm. towns uh, and, and uh, areas. Um, so, yes, I had major concerns and the automotive industry, new car sales, has been declining for um, well over two years now. So it's not like there are a number of brands easily uh, to be acquired by dealers. So, you know, you lose Holden, you can't simply take on another brand. It, it has happened, but it doesn't happen easily. Those concerns, however, Senator, have only um, increased since the pandemic. Um, we know now that we are heading towards a much higher employment than we've experienced in recent years, and every job counts, and, and that's where my concerns lie for these Holden dealers and their employees. So mm. we're, we're hoping that, you know, dealers will try their best to, to try and retain as many as employees as they can, but it's going to be very, very difficult. Mm. Um, in another submission, I think it's submission 19, that talks about the compensation package offered to, hold, um, to dealers by Holden grants a new five-year service and parts agreement. However, Holden have publicly said that they commit to providing customers with the support for the next 10 years. Mm. What, effect is going, uh, what effect is this going to have on the dealers? And are you concerned for your customers? Yeah, we are, you know, and it's another example of the, the sort of the 
deceptive PR machine. They were very quick to announce that they were committed to this market for 10 years, only to offer five-year service agreements to all of their dealers. So we actually do not know what's going to happen in the next five years. And if you put that into context, what we've seen in recent years with the world's biggest ever safety recall, the Takata airbag recall, I think we need strong commitment from manufacturers who are supplying cars in our market. We need to know that they're going to be there to honour their safety recall uh, obligations, their warranty obligations and their Australian consumer law obligations. Um, and as I said in my opening statement, uh, unfortunately GM do not have a good track record in this space, which is why the ACCC forced them to sign a court enforceable undertaking. Uh, so look, dealers will, uh, you know, sort of try and, uh, and service their consumers in the best way possible, but we really do need uh, sort of strong scrutiny on GM as it, as it moves out of the country and, um, and minimises its, its sort of uh, footprint. Um, we, we need to make sure that they um, have provisioned for any potential liabilities moving forward. A number of submissions, and you've kind of suggested that as well, have spoken about how they were blindsided by Holden's announcement of the shutdown. And also, I think you've suggested that as well, and other submissions have too, that they, they were consistent signals from Holden that they were actually in it for the long haul, even till like a year or a couple of years ago. So I'm finding it very hard to understand, given that it's such an iconic brand tied to, you know, Australian identity, that they would ruin their reputation um, you know, so quickly. Why do you think, if you have any views, why do you think they did this? Uh, look, unfortunately, it's the risk we run with every automotive manufacturer. Australia is a small market. We're a line item on their balance sheet back in Detroit. Uh, this was purely a business decision, and mm -hmm. um, it is being made a million, uh, you know, tens of thousands of miles from here by executives working in Detroit. Um, and that is why we need these strong protections, because these are the kinds of powerful businesses we're dealing with, and they don't often pay much attention to uh, Australia's laws. You need only look at the number of um, uh, sort of actions the ACCC has taken against various car manufacturers in recent years. Uh, there is a uh, you know, there is a casual relationship with the Australian law here. Um, so uh, that's probably what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, one more question, is that all right? Yes, thank you. In um, 2016, your organisation published an article, I think it was on your website, about cyber cars. Um, you know, I think it was a very secret. Is that still, if you could explain a little bit what that phenomenon is, is that still happening? How widespread is it? And why hasn't it been stopped? Um, so cyber cars is essentially, um, you know, it, it relates to the reporting mechanism we have in the automotive industry called VFACTS, which is the reporting of new car sales. Cyber cars was a practice whereby cars would be reported as sold even though they weren't necessarily sold. And manufacturers often use that tactic to pressurise their dealers to report cars as sold because it helps them demonstrate a bigger market share, which they then report back to their uh, sort of parent company. Um, it's very dangerous for dealers because it can result in dealers having an excess of stock and put them in financial harm. I'm glad to say, though, that um, it's been reined back slightly by the, the FCAI and their members, and that um, as of 1 January this year, you can only report a car as sold when it's registered. Mm. However, this doesn't... This, sorry, Senator. Keep going. Keep going. This doesn't stop the, 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 the practice of reporting cars as demonstrators um, and, and helping that to boost, uh, uh, you know, the, the market share in VFACTS. So what we'll be calling for going forward is that you can only report a car as sold when it actually has an end consumer. Um, so essentially eliminating demonstrators from the reporting set, and we believe that will um, help us have a, a much more credible data set, and this needs to be credible because it's relied on by the Reserve Bank, by the, the ABS and others in making very important decisions. So we, if we can remove demonstrators from the reporting, we can have a much uh, sort of uh, data set with more integrity, and we can also minimise some of that pressure that's applied on dealers for them to report these cars as, as registered. And that was happening in the case of Holden and GM as well? Uh, look, it happened with, with most manufacturers, uh, you know, and, and uh, 
you know, I, I don't sort of have a, a sort of a, a clear idea in my mind of where GM sat on the spectrum with regards to uh, sort of pressuring their dealers to pre-report, but it was by and large uh, done by many manufacturers. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you for coming along uh, today and giving us uh, the insights uh, into this serious uh, issue. Um, I just want to go back to the issue of uh, good goodwill um, and um, why do you believe that, that General Motors refused to make any compensation, in fact, fair compensation for uh, goodwill in the business? Sorry, Senator, is the question why they refuse to acknowledge goodwill? Yes, yes, why? What? That's an excellent... Yeah, look, that's, an, that's a good question. We would argue that, um, you know, much of the investment is undertaken by the dealer. The dealer has the relationship with the customer and they're, they're often, uh, you know, sort of taking the risks and uh, sort of, you know, creating the value in the business. Um, so, you know, we think that really does need to be considered when you are uh, sort of compensating your dealers. Uh, you know, and I think of, of an example where, um, you know, we currently have um, Mercedes-Benz um, looking at changing its model um, and has said that it will not be compensating its dealers um, as they embark on a new model. Um, but you can't move away from the fact that there are Mercedes-Benz dealers who have taken a brand in a particular area uh, from, you know, essentially nothing and probably grown it to the extent that, you um, you know, it has a, a sort of a massive database of loyal customers. Um, and, you know, many of these dealers would also have bought dealerships themselves and paid goodwill. So I think any compensation process really does need to have goodwill as a central element to it. Yeah, OK. And um, <clears throat> so it seems that General Motors uh, also are saying that the no compensation allow for their restrictions on um, holding dealers selling other brands. Yep. Um, why do you think General Motors, again, <clears throat> failed to take that into consideration um, yep. in, its, uh, in its offer? Oh, look, that's a good question because General Motors... Um over the past six months has used every opportunity to say how 90% of Holden dealers are multi-franchise. And I, I don't know why they keep saying that because I, I believe they somehow think this is an excuse to, um, to shortchange their dealers. It isn't an excuse. There should be no uh, sort of um, consideration of whether your dealer is multi-franchise or not. You should compensate them adequately for um, for the business that they've um, had uh, terminated. And you are 100% right, Senator. GM were one of the brands that in their dealer agreement has the right to refuse to allow a dealer to take on other brands. And they exercised that right. Um, and that becomes even more unconscionable when after exercising that right, they then withdraw from the Australian market, mm. having denied those dealers the opportunity to start another business. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Apollina uh, from General Motors told the AFR uh, one day before um, mediation was due to start on the 9th of June that we've got a lot of interest from other operators uh, in respect to other businesses buying the rights to service the existing Holden vehicles instead of the uh, Holden car dealers. Mm. Can you tell us uh, why do you think General Motors made what appears to be a rather thin veil threat against its holding dealers? Uh, yeah, that was truly an incredible statement because of when it was made. Um, we woke up on that morning, and I can't remember the date, but that was the morning of the start. 9th of, 9th of June. Yeah, 9th of June. 9th of June, and that was day one of mediation, good faith mediation, and it starts with the dealers... Uh, you know, who, who are about to enter that mediation, reading that Holden is discussing uh, giving their servicing contracts to independent repairers. Um, uh, and, and it needs to be remembered that automotive manufacturers um, 
you know, sort of provide the training, insist on the special tools to service these cars, but um, here they are on the morning of mediation, sort of suggesting that they have options and that they can go elsewhere. It was a thinly veiled threat, as you say, um, and it, it, it sort of undermined the mediation. Um, the other thing they did on that morning was they went on the ABC and um, proceeded to um, sort of say that the uh, Holden Dealer Council's legal team was, was just trying to drag this to court and drag out the process in order to make more money. Um, so that's on the morning that you're about to meet with the Holden dealers and their legal team that you've just trashed in the media. Um, so look, that just sums up this whole process and how little uh, sort of, you know, credibility they have when it comes to determining whether they engaged in a good faith process. All right, and um, Mr. Apollina also stated that, um, like you said, all holding businesses uh, on average uh, make a loss of $600 per vehicle in the last financial year, uh, with all profits um, coming from the parts and after sales service. Uh, but in an ABC media report, also on the 9th of June, he stated that. Uh, Last year, a single Holden dealer made a loss of around $600 per car for every new Holden they sold. Yeah. Um, why did uh, General Motors use different figures when trying to justify their offer to Holden dealers it was more than fair? I think it was a, you know, it's been a, a PR exercise from day one. Um, they have sort of completely, uh, you know, at every opportunity they've mentioned that the compensation offer they made to the dealers was fair and reasonable. <laughs> and they stood by that claim again and again until they were asked to engage in arbitration with this claim. Well, well, and the mediation and, and the arbitration, they, they, I think during mediation they continued to, to claim that the, the amount they'd uh, offered was fair. Um, but, you know, you'd think if their offer was fair and reasonable, they would have tested that claim through an arbitration process. They refused to do so, and I think that, uh, that asks serious questions about whether or not that, that uh, offer was, in fact, uh, fair and reasonable, as they kept saying it was. What, what would the organisation have hoped to have got out of an arbitration process if the company had been prepared to agree to that? I mean, what would your... Yeah. If you got, if you got your way, what would you want an arbitration process to produce? Look, the outcome I wouldn't comment on. Um, that would take its course. But what they would get is a much speedier resolution, a much lower cost resolution, um, and one that was uh, sort of, you know, sort of decided by an independent arbiter. So, you know, it, I think they would have had a fairer process is the question. Who knows? We'll never know what they would have gotten out of that process, but it would have been better than the, the half-baked um, uh, sort of mediation process that they did get. Yep. Thank you, unfortunately, we are... Uh... Yes. Uh, it's a bit of feedback there. Uh, not the sort of feedback we were hoping for. Um, <laughs> um, look, you've mentioned um, Mercedes-Benz uh, in the context of <clears throat> changing some of the arrangements. Can you tell us about any of the other potential problems with other manufacturers that uh, you can foresee <coughs> into the future? Yeah, well, look, I mean, Mercedes-Benz um, is considering um, changing to what's called an agency model, which is uh, very different to, to how dealers operate these days. In, in the new agency model, there'll be a, a different ownership of the vehicles and the dealer will act as an agent. Um, and um, there are various such models which are being trialled around the world. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a new sort of thing manufacturers are starting to do. And that is their right. They have the right to try new models. They have the right to sell vehicles online. They even have the right in Australia to sell directly, as they do in a number of cases. Um, that's not in question. Their right to change their business model is not in question. But 
when they have engaged partners and asked those are partners to expend significant capital in distributing their product, and then they want to change that model, we believe that it has to be done in a fair and transparent manner. Um, so that's all we ask. We'll have a number of changes coming down, uh, coming down the path, and um, the coronavirus is probably going to lead to some manufacturers making decisions about their future in this market. Um, I saw last week Mitsubishi's pulled out of the UK and Europe. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a time where decisions will be made and so be it. But um, when decisions are made and when uh, models are changed, dealers need to be compensated adequately and it's that simple. Thank you. That's uh, all the questions I had at the moment. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, that will conclude uh, our time with the Automotive uh, Dealer Association. Thank you for your evidence this morning. It's been extremely helpful.